The Sri Lankan government calls it de-radicalization. It's detaining those with what it says are extreme religious views and banning the burqa, but Muslims say it's discrimination. So will the new rule stop so-called Islamic extremism in this Asian country? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. Today with me, Peter Dobby. Now, many from Sri Lanka's minority Muslim community say they are being targeted. And in the latest decision affecting them, the government is reintroducing a ban on burqas. It says the full face covering for women is a sign of what it calls religious extremism. And it's barring them on national security grounds. More than 1,000 Muslim schools accused of flouting national education policy will also be shut. The move comes nearly two years after a series of attacks on hotels and churches on Easter Sunday. More than 250 people were killed in the assaults by armed groups in 2019. Now, let's have a listen to what the minister had to say. It affects our national security directly. In our early days, Muslim women and girls never wore the burqa. It is a sign of religious extremism that came about recently. We are definitely going to ban it. Also, there are more than 2,000 madrasa schools in the country. Nobody can open a school and teach whatever you want to the children. From ages 5 to 6, all children must study in accordance with the national education policy. Well, the decision to ban the burqa follows an order last year mandating that victims of COVID-19 should only ever be cremated. The practice is prohibited by Muslims who bury their dead. The ban on burials was lifted in February after months of protests by Muslim and human rights groups. Separately, the government said it would use a controversial anti-terror law to deal with religious violence. Manel Fernandez has been following the story. Here's her report from Colombo. The government's latest move is being sort of reacted to with concern among the Muslim community. Now, obviously, this doesn't affect all Muslim women in Sri Lanka. Not all of them wear the burqa. But the community in itself feel that this is another sort of a way of discrimination by the government against the Muslim minority. Now, the government, for its part, says that this is to ensure national security uh, and that uh, this... Uh, sort of new rule is needed. But obviously, from what we have seen in the recent past in terms of policies uh, and in general sort of treatment uh, of the Muslim community, there is concern, uh, particularly when you look at a new rule brought in under the Prevention of Terrorism Act uh, that essentially allows uh, a person to be held for up to two years. Uh, for the purposes of what the government calls rehabilitation. Uh, and this would uh, be for people holding sort of extreme violent religious ideologies. Uh, now, these are reasons that people uh, are beginning to question sort of the timing of this. We've just come at the end of one controversy where the government for a long period of time with the COVID-19 pandemic did not allow the burial of COVID-19 victims and this directly affected the Muslim and Catholic communities. Obviously, the Muslim community had a lot of issues with this, uh, had been struggling for this right and finally, uh, coincidentally, as the UN Human Rights Council sessions in Geneva took place, uh, the government conceded and allowed the burial of COVID-19 victims. So while on the one hand giving the Muslims back their burial rights, on this hand seems to be taking away the right of Muslim women to wear the burqa. OK, there we are. Here we go. Let's get going. And before we talk to our guests, all of whom are in Colombo today for Inside Story, just a quick word of, I guess, housekeeping more than anything else. We have tried all day to get representation from the Sri Lankan government. As of now, nobody was available to talk to us here on Al Jazeera. So let's get to those guests. They are Rauf Hakim, leader of the Sri Lanka Muslim Congress, a member of parliament and formerly a minister of justice. Shreen Abdul Sarur, a peace activist and co-founder of the Women's Action Network. Also, Jehan Pereira, executive director of the National Peace Council of Sri Lanka. Uh, welcome to you all. Rauf Hakim, as a former minister of justice, coming to you first, this is being done, we're told, on national security grounds. What does that mean? 
No, this is certainly an overreaction to an issue which uh, unnecessarily has been uh, uh, brought in to uh, stigmatize the Muslim community uh, for the wrong that is done by a small gang which had uh, unfortunately been the uh, perpetrators of the Easter Sunday attacks. But this uh, agenda has been there for a long time, ever since the uh, conclusion of the war. The conclusion of the war uh, brought about uh, a sense of triumphalism among the, the Sinhala majority. And the government of the time uh, felt it necessary to create a narrative uh, to uh, make the Muslims the next uh, enemy so that they can uh, uh, keep the uh, mobilization of the singular majority in their favor. And this is uh, uh, nothing but an effort, effort to uh, um, try and demonize and stigmatize uh, uh, a hapless community, which is uh, now uh, uh, getting marginalized day by day with all type of uh, racist uh, um, uh, policy decisions. And this is one such other thing. Shreen Abdul Sarur, part of the narrative here seems to come down to a stance on the part of the government. And they say, look, Muslim women never used to wear, wear the burqa anyway. So what's the problem if we insist that it's to be banned? To begin with, there is no clear-cut definition of what they are trying to ban because uh, some people are saying it's niqab, some people are saying it's uh, burqa, so uh, it's various forms of face covering, body covering. So the issue with uh, the community here is that uh, in my estimate, 1% of the Muslim women wear, still wear nik uh, niqab. Uh, and after the Easter Sunday attack, lots of women on their own removed it because then also under emergency regulation, they brought in not only face veil ban, there was a circular issued by public administration secretary to even remove the hijab. So our fear is what they are trying to ban at a time where everybody is wearing face mask and covering their face. If it is national security, it's for everybody to identify. I mean, there is no identification whatsoever right now. And what is it all about women, uh, Muslim women's uh, attire being connected to extremism and uh, them being demonized, as uh, Honorable uh, Rao Hakim said? Jehan Pereira from the National Peace Council, also in Colombo. Uh, Shreen Abdul Sarur raises a very valid point there, doesn't she? Because is the government, and it would be nice if somebody from the government was here, they are not, they've declined our, our invitation. Are they cynically going into a grey area? Because it seems to me that most people outside of the Muslim world, indeed most people perhaps even in the broader Muslim world, world they don't know the difference between the, the hijab, the niqab and the burqa anyway. Yes, um... We can uh, say that the, the, the decision has still not been taken. I think that's the reason why the government representatives do not want to come, because uh, what is there on the table now is a proposal signed by one, one minister, the Minister of uh, National Security. and uh, But it has not been yet accepted by the cabinet, and it also has to go before parliament. I think the government is aware that this is a very controversial matter, and, they, and they, they have not come to a, a conclusion. And I hope that their decision is not to ban the, the burqa and also to close down 1,000 uh, Muslim madrasas, the Sunday schools, uh, on the grounds that they are not uh, regulated, they have not registered with the ministry. Of course, they can ask them to register and they can supervise them, but I don't think they should be closing them. Uh, but as the uh, as uh, Mr. Rao Hakim and Shireen, Shireen said, uh, there's a, there, the issue of nationalism here. Uh, this government, this is a government that was elected on the basis of, of majority nationalism, Sinhalese nationalism, as well as the, the desire to protect national security. And it came... And this government was elected in the aftermath of the Easter bombings, which were by uh, Muslims. Though, as was pointed out by Mr. Hakim, 
this group of Muslims who uh, performed this action, many of them were very educated young people, educated abroad in foreign countries, and who had no real organic links with Sri Lanka. So you can you cannot blame the Muslim community for that. But that is what has happened. That is, in fact, and that's the injustice of what has happened, because traditionally, the Sri Lankan Muslims have been an extremely peaceful community. Uh, they have never, in, they were victims in the 30-year war between the Sri Lankan state and the, and the Tamil uh, rebels. Uh, so, and even prior to that, there is no real history of the Muslims being terrorists or being violent. And it has been the case even after that. Okay. After this Easter okay. attack, there has been no incident of Muslim aggression. So it is really unfair that the government should be targeting the Muslims in this way. Rauf Hakim, again, coming back to you as, as a former Minister of Justice, I guess if we could ask the government, and we're heading towards the two-year anniversary of the Easter attacks, in the run-up to that time, which presumably there will be more tension almost palpably in the air as people remember what happened two years ago. I guess the government might admit we had to make the entire country feel safer. That was why we brought the ban in almost two years ago. But how does it make the country, even the majority Buddhist population, feel safer now if they introduce this ban going forward? The government attempts to carry on a continuous, relentless propaganda through their captive uh, media organizations, both government media as well as private media, to create uh, Islamophobic uh, fear psychosis. This has been their uh, main ploy throughout. And now with the uh, Easter Sunday attacks, uh, uh, Presidential Commission report out, we can see there is a clear overreach by the commission also going into such controversial controversial topics such as banning this, that or the other in order to appease uh, the majority sentiment that has been created by uh, a very well-planned uh, media strategy of the government. And this is what is very unfortunate. Uh, what do they... But they don't realise, as Jehan said, um, the... Uh, 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 so-called uh, group of people who had committed this heinous crime uh, appears to be a cult which has been uh, the making uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, certain intelligence uh, operation to uh, demonize the Muslims. In fact, uh, pit the Muslims against the Catholics. We had absolutely no enmity with uh, any um, religious communities, uh, so much so uh, the, the Catholics themselves, then these are the two communities which voted overwhelmingly against uh, this regime uh, in the regime change that took place um, five years ago. Okay. And that was perhaps the reason why such a uh, plot was uh, designed and uh, executed. OK, I'd like to get into the, the political manoeuvrings surrounding this in a couple of minutes, if we may. Shreen Abdul Sarur, the Colombo Gazette today, on its website, is talking about this as being a racist agenda. However, if we look at around the world, France, Belgium, Austria and Italy, just four countries that have either enacted this kind of legislation or I think the Italian government about four or five years ago had it drafted, didn't carry through on it. In Europe, it seems as if it's a much more nuanced debate that everyone gets a chance to engage with and the governments of the day react accordingly. If that supposition on my part is right, what does it tell us about the Sri Lankan government that they are not prepared to do the same thing? So, um, as I pointed out previously, also the Muslim community after Easter attack, we have been looking inward and we have been trying to look at what went wrong within the community. So Sri Lankan government should have had consultation with Muslim women because oftentimes it's men who define our dress code. Even for women to wear hijab or abaya or you know niqab, 
we don't want our Muslim men to tell us what we should wear. We have to decide what we have to wear. It's about our dignity and our body and our dress code. So in that context, the Sri Lankan government should have had consultation with women, particularly burqa, niqab wearing women, and to have their consent and also to tell them, because it's psychological feeling of all of a sudden removing something you have been wearing since your teenage uh, uh, age, for, for you to remove, it's like you. Many women feel that they are naked, uh, so it, that that's that's the concept that they have acknowledged as modesty and piety and all those things. So that conversation never happened, and also like Sri Lanka should not borrow bad examples from other countries. I we are a pluralistic country. Our constitution talks about multi uh, diversity multi community and we have article 10 uh, talks about our religious freedom article 12 talks about equality before law so with all those things sri lankan government miserably failed consulting this community and and it's continuously targeting the muslim community because this is bartering the rights like they gave us a few weeks ago our burial rights that very unfairly they took it away from us using COVID, and that day itself, the justice minister, who is also a Muslim told, niqab will be taken away. What, what, what is the government doing? I mean, by bartering rights in the country, and that also, they, they have to take the Muslim women's right, because all those men who blow themselves up never wear, wear, wore any niqab or hijab or burqa or whatever. They are all men. So in that context, why are they penalizing the women? This is the question that we all have. Jehan Pereira from the National Peace Council. The Sri Lankan government is also reportedly closing down up to a thousand Muslim schools. Presumably, that decision making process came after a period of scrutiny where government inspectors, education inspectors, were going into the schools and saying, no, you are in breach of national education policy. Do we know if similar Christian schools were subjected to uh, not dissimilar scrutiny on the part of the authorities? Uh, no, we have not heard that. And of course, the justification for that would be that the Christians are currently not a security threat, whereas the Muslims are a security threat because of what happened in, on Easter Sunday. Um, but I, I think that uh, that, is not, that is not fair at all. They should uh, come out and say what actually they are finding. If, if they are finding something that, the, that is being taught at the mad madrasas, they must come out and tell that. And also, they, most of the madrasas are also registered with the government. I think the ones that they are planning to close down are ones that have not yet registered. They should be asked to register. Ralph Hakim, is Mr Rajapaksa, to go back to the, the political dynamic that you were talking to us about a little earlier, is Mr Rajapaksa here kind of riding a wave, if you will, of identifying a minority, implicitly pointing a finger of suspicion at that minority, even though that minority have done nothing wrong, and that's a, that's a journal of record, that, that's a matter of, of journalistic fact, that the Muslim minority have done nothing wrong in the country. Because the president, two years ago, talked about the burqa as being, quote, the flag of fundamentalism. Didn't describe it as an item of clothing, talked about it in very loaded terminology. Yes, indeed. This has been the uh, uh, narrative that they have created uh, all throughout in order to mobilise uh, the single majority in their favour. And, uh, you know, pl playing such uh, cheap politics has been uh, their brand. And that uh, is quite apparent. But what we are concerned today is that uh, when you talk about these madrasa uh, schools, I mean, they are still to produce uh, strong evidence to suggest. They are only talking about this Wahhabi ideology and then uh, various other uh, doctrines that are... Uh, polluting the uh, uh, the, the uh, um, uh, climate of uh, 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 coexistence in the country, they they are yet to produce uh, strong evidence from the curricula itself that are being taught in the madrasa. I I definitely I very categorically deny there is uh, no such uh, devious and uh, dim. Uh, uh, dangerous uh, 
um, content in the curricula of these madrasas except for uh, you know teaching religious scriptures because our madrasa system is has been an age old system that has been practiced over a period of time but there is a disproportionate attention being paid to muslim schools uh, on the pretext of trying to be uh, uh, too intrusive to look at uh, their curricula but we the community itself is quite capable of self regulating uh, our own uh, religious instruction uh, schools which we have been doing and we after the easter sunday attacks have uh, taken upon ourselves a need okay. to do a serious introspection within the community and we are we are doing this so that they must leave these matters for self regulation okay well, i'm going to interrupt you there but we so are we are very quickly heading towards the end of the program and there are a final couple of points i want to get in uh, jehan perera when it comes to the court of public opinion how do your buddhist friends you know the 70 80 90% of the population across the country react to this because it feels as if we're talking about a government that wants to shunt a country towards being suspicious of the different to be intimidated by a minority instead of saying look we're basically a sec secular society and we can and we should all live in peace particularly given what shreen abdul sarur was telling us just 2 minutes ago about how people's minority rights are actually enshrined in the paperwork that constitutes sri lanka as a sovereign state yeah, the the sri, the sri lankan majority the sinhalese people there is an insecurity in the sinhalese coming from their history ancient history of tamil invasions 2000 years ago colonialism 500 years and then what happened in more recent past where india supported the tamil militants against the sri lankan state the internationalization of the conflict so it is the sinhalese it is very easy to make the sinhalese feel insecure and the easter attack really did that it made them very insecure and uh, so it, so up till recently i think the sinhalese would have been uh thinking that the muslims are a real threat but i have noticed that where this most recent uh, the burqa ban and the madrasa closure is concerned what i'm seeing on social media is a different story they are saying what i'm reading is that people are saying this is to divert attention from other problems because the government is facing very serious problems economic problems we are close to defaulting we are very desperately asking china for uh, loans to to tide over our foreign exchange crisis uh, there is uh, the covid is also pretty bad like it is bad in the rest of the world but the economy really bad then there is a huge uh, 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 corruption scam relating to sugar imports i think uh, so people are saying this is to distract attention and also elections are coming there's going to be provincial elections in 3 or 4 months okay last so word in the last that. minute of the program jehan i'm going to stop you there as well last 30 seconds of the program to you shreen abdul sarur if there is to be a push for a positive dialogue a constructive dialogue either surrounding this specific issue that we're talking about today the burqa because that seems to be symbolic for so many people or just minority rights in the country who's going to drive that where is that going to come from is there anyone in the political world of sri lanka who is prepared to send out a message of look we're all the same let's just get on with each other uh, we are in a very tough time uh, this particular um, a uh, regime uh, has openly said the head of the state himself has uh, he has said it's a singala country and he is a president for a buddhist uh, i mean on a independent day so he has clearly disowned the minorities in this country our future is uh, with the international uh, processes uh, because if you carefully look at sri lankan government even reacted to all our outcry Uh, inside uh, going to supreme court to various human rights mechanism with regard to cremation they only listen to international community so international pressure, pressure is the only way forward and sri lanka's uh, resolution against sri lankan state is coming on uh, geneva human rights council on 22 uh, there are lots of muslim countries as members and then we look forward to that resolution to be passed because that resolution in operational paragraph 7 and 8 talks about 
minority communities and their uh, rights because if sri lanka really need reconciliation and peace they wouldn't antagonize minorities like the, uh, like this and this but with this particular government i don't think there is a way forward uh, with okay. any form of dialogue i'm Okay, Shreen, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you to our guests. As ever here on Inside Story, the clock has beaten us. Our guests were Rauf Hakim, Shreen Abdul Soro, and Jihan Pereira. And just to reiterate what I said at the top of the show, uh, we did ask somebody from the government to join us for this uh, contentious debate out of Sri Lanka. Nobody was available to talk to Al Jazeera today. You can see this program again, of course, via the website, aljazeera.com. You can talk to us via Facebook, facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story, or talk to us on Twitter, our handle at AJ Inside Story. From me, Peter Dobby, and the team here in Doha, thanks for watching. We will see you very soon for the moment. Bye-bye.